We greet you this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we come this day to partake of the sacrament, we come in a day of remembrance of he who laid down his life for us, that we might have life and life everlasting. So let us come and worship. Let us come and praise. Let us come and offer our gifts this day unto him that we might seek to glorify him in all that we do. Our opening hymn will be him, let us shake off the coals of our garments. And in some hymnals, that's 580, 581. So just be mindful that it's 583 in some. It's in the back of the book. I know that. Hymn number five, let us shake off the coals of our garments. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we uh, enter into this service, I would ask uh, an invocation. We would invite your spirit to be with us, to sit right next to us, to be in our hearts. I pray that we might uh, let those things of this world that uh, weigh us down, I pray that we might set those aside, not be burdened by them. For we know that you carry that burden and that you make that light for us. And so I'd pray that we might uh, anchor our hearts with you, that we might be with one in one, and that you might be with our brother Trace as he uh, offers up those words that are placed on his heart. Be with us as we reach forth our hand to uh, accept that broken body and spilt blood that we might understand the importance of that and the significance and how it impacts our life. We thank you in Christ's name we pray, amen. For our hearing this morning, I'll be reading two passages of Scripture. 
first one is from Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 22. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and break it and blessed it and gave to his disciples and said, Take, eat this in remembrance of my body, which I give a ransom for you. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is in remembrance of my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for as many as shall believe on my name for the remission of their sins. And I give unto you a commandment that ye shall observe to do the things which ye have seen me do and bear record of me even unto the end. And from 3 Nephi, in chapter 8, starting in verse 28. And it came to pass that Jesus commanded his disciples that they should bring forth some bread and wine unto him. And while they were gone for bread and wine, he commanded the multitude that they should set themselves down upon the earth. And when the disciples had come with bread and wine, he took of the bread and brake and blessed it. And he gave unto the disciples and commanded that they should eat. And when they had eaten and were filled, he commanded that they should give unto the multitude. And when the multitude had eaten and were filled, he said unto the disciples, Behold, there shall be one ordained among you, and to him will I give power that he shall break bread and bless it, and give it unto the people of my church, and to all those who shall believe and be baptized in my name. And this shall ye always observe to do, even as I have done, even as I have broken bread and blessed it, and gave it unto you. And this shall ye do in remembrance of my body, which I have shown unto you. And it shall be a testimony unto the Father that ye do always remember me. And if ye do always remember me, ye shall have my spirit to be with you. And it came to pass that when he had said these words, he commanded his disciples that they should take of the wine of the cup and drink of it, and that they should also give unto the multitude that they might drink of it. And it came to pass that they did so and did drink of it and were filled. And they gave unto the multitude and they did drink and they were filled. And when his disciples had done this, Jesus said unto them, Blessed are ye for this thing which ye have done. For this is fulfilling my commandments, and this does witness unto the Father that ye are willing to do that which I have commanded you. And this shall ye always do unto those who repent and are baptized in my name. And ye shall do it in remembrance of my blood, which I have shed for you, that ye may witness unto the Father that ye do always remember me. And if ye do always remember me, ye shall have my spirit to be with you. And I give unto you a commandment that ye shall do these things. And if ye shall always do these things, blessed are ye, for ye are built upon my rock. We come today. We come to remember our Lord and Savior. We come because he has called us to come. He has commanded us to come and do these things. And we come out of love. We come out of a love because he loves us. And we come and we lay down before him this day, ourself so that he might fill us and the promise is there before us that his spirit will be with us. And so this day as we come, let nothing separate you from that which is before you this day. Come and be filled with his spirit and partake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
as the prayer is read upon the bread, can we kneel as much as possible? O God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of thy Son, and witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments, which he has given them that they may always have his spirit to be with them. Amen.
much as possible. Please kneel once again. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls, all those that may drink of it, that they may do it in remembrance of the blood of Thy Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto Thee, O oh God, the Eternal Father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his spirit to be with them. Amen.
I will not follow the instructions of my pastor who just told me to sing out. I will not sing. Um, in the Gospel of John, the third chapter, starting with the first verse, and um, as of this morning, I still hadn't decided how far to read, so we'll see. There was man, a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles which thou doest, except God be with him. Nicodemus knows who he is. I just really had glossed over that he came to him by night so that he wouldn't be seen. Jesus answered and said, Verily, and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee that you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth. Thou, canst, thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? I think I'll stop there for the moment. So, what does it mean to be born again? Jesus says we have to be born of the water and the Spirit. I think the answer, born of the water, is relatively straightforward. We need to be baptized. Being baptized is literally to be buried in the water and to rise up a new creature in God. But what does it mean to be born of the Spirit? That's a little less solid. So I'm going to try to give some scriptural examples and some personal examples. Um, consider Jonah. In the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verse 1, God calls upon Jonah to go to Nineveh. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Jonah tried to hide. In fact, he went down to the seashore, caught a ship, and left the country. That didn't work out so well for Jonah, and it didn't work out very well for his shipmates. You know, God sent a storm, and the entire crew feared for their lives. Jonah finally has compassion on the sailors and admits that it's his fault that they're in this situation and asks them to throw him overboard, which they do. I'm not sure that's a type and shadow of baptism, but it could be. He is certainly in the water. God prepares a great fish. The fish swallows Jonah. He's in the belly of the fish for three days. Type and shadow of Jesus being in the tomb. While he's there, it changes him. He realizes that he can't hide from God. He realizes that God is powerful, and he realizes that he belongs to him. Jonah humbles himself and agrees to do what God commanded him. He was reborn of the Spirit, and he went on to Nineveh, which was not um, friendly to prophets, and preached the gospel. He was reborn of the Spirit, I do believe. King David. Um, was a man after God's own heart. But there were, was hardly anybody in the scriptures who spent more time doing things to be in need of repentance than David. But he always came back. He always knew who his father was, who his protector was. 
and he always humbled himself and came back, felt true remorse for those things he had done. And there were uh, Alma, the son of Alma, and the sons of Moziah, Ammon, Aaron, Omner, and Hemni. They were intentionally trying to destroy the church, going out of their way, preaching lies. They knew it. But because of the prayers of Alma's father, and because of the prayers of the church for him, God sent an angel. And Alma was changed. He was changed in spirit and chose to spend the rest of his days along with the sons of Mosiah preaching the gospel and trying to repair the damage that they had done when they were younger. I believe it's fair to say that they were baptized of the Spirit as well. There's the woman taken in adultery. She was caught in the act. She knew she was guilty. She was not unaware of the law. She knew what her punishment was, and she knew it was harsh. Stoning is neither pleasant nor quick. She felt pretty low, pretty worthless. She didn't try to run. She just sat there at Jesus' feet, waiting for that which she knew was to come. Yet Jesus saw her heart. And he challenged those who had accused her. And they had a change of heart. And when the woman looked up, her accusers were gone. And all that was left was Jesus. And I love it when he asks the uh, questions that he already knows the answers to. He says, woman, where are thine accusers? They were all too embarrassed to throw the first stone, as they should have been. If you believe that she is uh, Mary Magdalene, I suspect that she is. The evidence that she was reborn of the Spirit is that she followed Jesus for the rest of his time on earth and never ceased to worship him. The prodigal son's another one. He's uh, He had everything, but he was unhappy. So uh, he didn't show any respect to his father. Didn't really have very good stewardship, asked for his money. His father gave it to him. And it said he went to a far country, and he was engaged in riotous living. I will uh, not try to speculate that what that was, but I will leave it to your imagination what that might be. But I don't think it was uh, following his heavenly father. And after his money runs out, and he realized that those that he thought were his friends were only there for what he could do for them. He realized that no one loves him more than his father, which in the parable is his heavenly father. He's humbled. And he returns, not to be the son, but to be the servant. And you would think that... Uh, justice would be that his father would allow him to be that servant. He already spent his inheritance. But 
but his father didn't want him to be a servant. His father wanted him to be his son, to know that he was his, that he belonged to him. Such is the love of the father. And the last scriptural example I'd use would be Saul of the New Testament, who became Paul. So firm were his convictions as Saul that he was actually murdering Christians. So strong was his faith that God saw that he could use someone like that and changed him. Gave him that opportunity to know. And... uh, You stop and think about it. Saul went from murdering Christians to writing approximately two-thirds of the New Testament. That's a pretty big rebirth right there spiritually. He was reborn and he was forgiven. On uh, a personal level, I've got a couple of people I'll use here. I had a, a work friend at, when I was with the IRS. Um, we used to have a good time with each other. I, was, uh, I would do technical support for some people who were trying to settle some sometimes fairly large cases. And uh, some of those people were kind of um, maybe a little prima donna-ish. And they would send me instructions on what we, they wanted me to do to recalculate the taxes. And sometimes those instructions weren't very good, but I would do what they asked. And um, we had a couple in particular that, even though the instructions were bad, they expected us to read their minds and get it right anyway. And so I learned to be uh, going to their offices hat in hand and play the humble one and and uh, try to make sure we didn't ruffle any more feathers than I had to. Um, it's not to say it was never my fault. But when I took work to him one day and he got what he asked for but not what he wanted, and I apologized for not giving him what he wanted and he apologized for not writing good instructions and we went back and forth three or four times and he finally smiled at me and he said, I'm not going to let you out humble me. We both laughed. Uh, somewhere along the line, he'd learned to do that too. And I'm going to guess he learned to do that growing up. He was raised in part by uh, an alcoholic father who was both verbally and physically abusive to him and his sister and his mother. His mother eventually divorced his father, and uh, his mother and sister eventually lost contact with their husband and ex-husband and father. My friend didn't lose contact with his father, and somewhere along the line, and he never told me what it was, his father had a conversion experience. And he changed. His father died never having reestablished that connection. And at the funeral, my friend was there along with his sister and his mother and my friend's wife, who only knew the father after the conversion experience. And my friend told me, he said, I've I caught the irony. I was, I was standing there and I started smiling. And the mom, who still bore some ill feelings toward uh, her ex, looked at him and said, what are you smiling about? And he said, you two knew the old man. He pointed to his wife and said, she knew the new man. I knew them both. His reward 
for the patience and perseverance with his father was to get to see that change. That's pretty awesome. And finally, I had a uh, friend at Graceland who was um, he was a little bit on the honorary side. Several of us were somewhat on the honorary side back then. And uh, he was involved in a lot of pranks. Some of those pranks included things that ended up with livestock in the girls' dormitories. When you're Graceland and you're on farm country, you can find cows and horses and whatever. And I don't know if you all know, but cows like to go upstairs. Cows can't go downstairs. So getting them out was more interesting than it should have been. Anyway, several decades later, um, I was talking with one of the girls that, that had been affected by some of those pranks. And uh, our mutual acquaintance name came up. And uh, I mentioned that he was now a member of the priesthood. And she was aghast. Stop that. <laughs> um, and she said that she didn't think she could really accept ministry from him based on what she had experienced with him in the past. And it really caught me off guard. Because I too was standing there in the position of having known the old man and the new man. I guess the honorary in me, I didn't say it, but later wished I had. I wished I'd ask her, well, how do you feel about the New Testament? Do you reject most of it? Because it was written by a man who did far worse. Far worse. Yet God found a way to use him. You know, the thought of becoming new people has been pretty much on my mind since the retreat. My brother Howard again delivered to us that we had been forgiven. It's not unusual to be forgiven by God. He does it all the time. Because pretty much we need forgiveness all the time. You know, there was a book out a few years ago that was uh, titled God Uses Cracked Pots. Anybody hear of that? I never read the book. Do you know why he uses cracked pots? Because we're all cracked pots. We're all cracked pots. I don't know anybody who's perfect. Certainly not the guy looking back at me from the mirror. We're all cracked pots. We have imperfections. We have faults. But God loves us anyway. I know that uh, probably most of you have perfect children. But for those who don't, do you forgive them when they're wrong? Do you still love them when they're wrong? God's even better. I would encourage you to hold fast to the rod of iron because it will tell you all things that you should do. I'm going to read from the third chapter of Colossians. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. With Christ, who is our life, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. 
Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil, and I'm not going to try to pronounce that word because I don't know what it is, but it's in the third chapter of Colossians. You all can look it up. Covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things that for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. Lie not to one another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, do also ye. We have the good news, sometimes known as glad tidings or good tidings. Your Heavenly Father who created you loves you and loves you so much that he gave his only begotten Son Today he has uh, invited us to his table to partake of his holy sacrament. All he asks is that we remember his son and keep his commandments. He promises that if we do, we will always have his spirit to be with us. He continues to seek after us and to forgive us that we may become new people, born again. You all know that I uh, occasionally use humor from the pulpit. I'm about to tell a story that's usually a joke. But today I want you to think of it as a parable. The rains came for many days and the floodwaters rose. And some houses started to be uh, underwater. And a man of faith climbed upon his roof and prayed to his God that he would save him. And pretty soon along came a canoe and offered the man a chance to get off the roof. And the man said, no, My God will save me. And a little later, a motorboat came and made the offer. And again, the man said, no, my God will save me. And then a helicopter. That's not the end of that story. And it's not the end of how it works. Because after all God has done to try to save us, he also sent his son and gave him to be sacrificed for our sins. So I would encourage you, get in the canoe, get in the boat, take the ride in the helicopter and accept the gift of the son. Become a new and forgiven person in and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And do that, that we may each become stronger members of this body, that we may be useful tools in the hands of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that his kingdom might be promoted.
I'm probably the biggest crackpot of all <clears throat> in that uh, <clears throat> I meant to get hold of Tony uh, earlier in the week and even yesterday, and I didn't get that done. But, uh, you know, a part of that uh, kingdom building process is to uh, continue to reach out and to share and to help others. And, you know, we've been striving to do that in our congregation uh, each month to uh, take on a project to help others around about us. And this month of uh, giving, a Thanksgiving, uh, Tony is going to be heading up and Mariah is going to head up a little project for us. So I'm going to have him just talk about that and what we as a congregation can do to assist that. So when he gets done, I'll just offer a word of prayer. Good morning. So one of the things that uh, provides a great ministry in our community is an organization called Harvesters. And I think uh, there's lots of groups that have done fundraising for Harvesters in the past, but one of the things that they do is provide food to those in need, and it's a community food network. And so uh, the idea that came to us was to um, organize a food drive. Now we've done food drives before, um, but in this setting, what we're looking to do is they have this family meal box program. They provide these ingredient cards that we can then print and have available. Um, we can send a link and publish it to the Facebook site as well, but ultimately they provide a list of Here's the ingredients that can go in to feed um, eight meals. Um, it is a specific thing, and I think some examples um, that were out there uh, as a food box was barbecued chicken burrito bowls. And then it says this is what the box will include, and it gives you specific things to look for and purchase. Um, and sometimes that's easier if you're out shopping to have a list of I need these things, right? Um, and so I think... For the drive, um, we're thinking of this, of course, as Thanksgiving time and a great opportunity to provide a meal. There are opportunities for those in need to find a Thanksgiving meal. So we wanted to kind of expand this out a little bit um, and have these bowls, these these baskets that can be created. Um, so we'll, we'll have some information available. We'll look to do the collection, same as before, just bring any of the food items here. Um, and then we'll box up and, and get those sent out kind of around that week of Thanksgiving as well. Mariah, is there anything that I've left out? Good. Reach out if you have any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Tony and Mariah, for heading that up for us. And uh, <clears throat> I know it's kind of short notice, and maybe Tony can drop something on the uh, Facebook page or the Parkview website or something about that, and we'll get more information this week and even next Sunday. So it's always an opportunity for us to reach out and to share and to help others, and that's part of what we're called to do, and that's part of our... Uh, Oblation as part of reaching out and sharing that love of Christ as we've been so richly blessed. And, you know, we, we're still not passing the plate, per se, here to collect tithes and offerings and oblations. And those are in the foyer on the tables for your giving as you come and go from the sanctuary. But uh, it is a time of uh, thanksgiving, and we have so much to be thankful for. And the Lord has blessed us all so richly. And so we would just... Uh, Seek to let those blessings flow unto others that they might receive. Would you bow with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this uh, Sabbath day when we come uh, before thy table, Father. And we have been richly blessed because we have uh, stretched forth our hand, Father, and we received uh, your Son, Jesus Christ, within us. And Father, we've received uh, your word uh, that our brother Trace has brought unto us this day. To know the importance, Father, of uh, 
allowing your spirit to, to be born within us as well as to be born of the water. And so I would pray that we might continue to uh, reach out and to share, to allow your spirit to be with us, to guide and direct us. And as we give, Father, of those uh, uh, stewardships of our life, whether it's our finances, our time, our talents, we know, Father, it's uh, given out of love because you loved us. And so I pray that we might be found faithful, that we might be obedient, and that we might continue to always have your spirit to be with us. Father, we praise you and thank you and ask for your continued blessings upon us. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn will be hymn number 198, and that is the third tune. I forgot to put that in the uh, bulletin, but third tune of 198. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, uh, we each who have made a covenant with you have uh, reached forth our hand. And uh, we each have that opportunity, Lord, to uh, represent you in our lives to others. Lord, uh, your gift is, uh, of your son is so perfect. It is so perfect that uh, the love that you have for us, Lord, is uh, immense. Help us to recognize that in uh, everything that we do, in every part of our daily life. 
whether we glimpse of a part of nature or see rainfall or see it in the uh, eyes of a little child. Help us to recognize you in all things. Help us to glorify you every chance that we get. Father, there are those who uh, are unable to be here. Continue to bless them, Lord. Bless them with uh, your love and your healing spirit. And would you bless this entire congregation as we go to our individual homes. May it be your blessing upon them. And I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.